Uh, my name is Mahmoud Rozavi, and uh, together with my co-moderator, Dr. Uh, Thomas Zeller, uh, our first speaker, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Jaff uh, to the podium, and the topic is supervised exercise. Michael? Thank you, Mahmoud and Thomas. Uh, thanks to the course organizers for inviting me. That takes a couple of minutes. It does. I have to wait for yeah. people to read this. <laughs> Uh, I can tell you that there's not a single conflict that I have that has anything to do with this discussion whatsoever, but uh, you have these in your handouts as well. So uh, that was my uh, list of conflicts. So I'm here to talk to you about supervised exercise therapy, uh, what, when, and how, and it would be uh, really remiss for me not to take a moment to thank a close friend and colleague, Alan Hirsch, who passed away actually one year ago right now. Um, uh, who never got to actually see that uh, CMS decided to fund supervised exercise therapy, something he worked on for his entire career. So this uh, talk is uh, in memory of Alan. So I, you know, I view this as life having choices, uh, and the choices aren't always mutually exclusive, and I think that's the message here. I think the message is it's not just whether you should offer supervised exercise therapy instead of something else. So the, what do I mean by this? Well, for example, you're flying on an airplane and you choose to fasten your seatbelt or not. If you need to put a mask, an oxygen mask on, you choose to do it or not. I mean, these are just silly things. Well, it's, it's the same kind of concept. And when you care for patients with claudication, you only have one goal, right? You believe that whatever you offer them is going to make them feel better, walk faster and farther, and get back to their normal life. So when you see this in a patient who presents with hip discomfort with walking, you immediately have to decide whether you're going to do this or you're going to do this, because I don't think anybody would offer surgery for this anymore. Well, there are guidelines and there are position statements that discuss what therapeutic strategies are available. And on this one CERC research paper, which is a great review, uh, if you look on the symptomatic side, Everything starts off with medical therapy and risk factor intervention, which uh, Josh is going to talk about momentarily. Strategies to reduce the risk of limb loss, which in that particular case would be very low. And then how do you improve their symptoms? We all understand that basically these are narrowed pathways, but it goes way farther than just a clogged pipe resulting in the inability of patients to walk. And so where would exercise play a role? Well, it turns out that it's much more than what we generally tell our patients, which is this can stimulate collateral pathways, right? That's what you tell your patients. New routes of blood that go around the area of narrowing. But there's a lot that we now know about impact on mitochondrial dysfunction, oxygen hemoglobin so dissociation curves, induction of angiogenesis, et cetera. And these metabolic and mitochondrial abnormalities are really at the core of why patients become deconditioned and can't walk. So you can reassure your patients that not only is this helping their ability to walk, but it's actually going to help their ability to live longer. So what about exercise therapy? Well, there's a ton of literature out there. This is the older literature. This was a Cochrane review of 22 randomized controlled trials. And just with supervised exercise therapy alone, you increase maximal walking time, pain-free and maximal walking distance to great degrees, clinically meaningful degrees. And so the guidelines actually went as far as to tell you what the prescription for supervised exercise therapy should be. So those prescriptions include things like happening three times a week for anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes at a time. Patients should walk to maximal discomfort and stop and stand, not when they first start to feel discomfort. They should walk at a pace that brings on the discomfort sooner. So the more aggressively you are in a supervised exercise program, the faster patients will see clinical benefit. This should continue for at least 12 weeks. And in association with this, don't miss the opportunity to talk about cholesterol and diabetes and cigarette smoking and, and uh, all of that stuff. So as a result of all of this data and really decades of lobbying Medicare, Medicare decided that it was worthwhile now to fund supervised exercise therapy. And in fact, there's now not only a reimbursement code, but reimbursement for this. So why not then just offer exercise as the sole initial treatment for claudication? 
Well, I think this is the real reason. A, patients really don't like doing this. When they feel discomfort, for any reason, they want the discomfort to go away. Supervised exercise therapy is not a quick fix. It takes time. And so if your patient's not motivated, this just is not going to work. And secondly, they want to make you feel better. So they'll tell you that they're going to walk and things just aren't getting better when, in fact, they're just standing on the front porch for 30 minutes. So does this work? Well, it works. It just doesn't work quickly. So if you tell patients, hey, do this every day or three times a week, in three months you're notice, going to notice a dramatic improvement, you're guaranteed that they're going to come back disappointed or go someplace else. So six months is kind of the window. And by the way, it doesn't help everyone. So if you were really going to consider designing a therapy, you'd probably do it for people who have infrainguinal disease as opposed to superinguinal disease. But nonetheless, it does help. And by the way, it's way more effective than, supervised ex than unsupervised exercise therapy. So if you do this at home, it's way more effective. Hmm. Trying to go backwards. Maybe I can't go backwards. There we go. So what data do we have? Well, I know Josh is going to go over Clever and Erase in a much greater detail than me, so I just want to show you that that Cochrane review was old data, initial data. The more modern data shows you comparisons of endovascular therapy to exercise. This is the Clever study, the NIH trial, and in this study, which looked at aortoiliac disease in claudication, Supervised exercise improved peak walking time more effectively than optimal medical therapy. But at 18 months, the benefits were lost. The ERASE trial actually compared the combination of supervised exercise and endovascular therapy than exercise alone. Back to my opening comments, it's not one versus another. And in this series, it looked like the combination therapy was way more effective. Now, why didn't we show that in Clever? because we couldn't enroll that fourth arm of the trial. The enrollment rate was so slow that we basically lost funding and had to end the trial where we did. The guidelines actually support revascularization and or guidelines-based medical therapy. And so it's clear to me that supervised exercise therapy is first-line treatment for claudication, but for that osteal common iliac artery stenosis, I would think that the best therapy would be fix that lesion percutaneously, and then enroll the patient in a supervised exercise program. Thanks very much. Thank you, Michael. Please stay on the podium for the discussion later on. Um, so I would like to ask Dr. Beckman now to give his um, talk about <coughs> non-invasive hemodynamics in aortoiliac disease. Okay, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. It stinks when you get older and you can't put on your glasses to see close. There we go, come on. So I asked the organizers of this meeting, what does this mean, that the talk that's listed in there? And they couldn't tell me. So this is the talk that they said, you know what, we'd rather hear you do this. And so I said, okay, I can do that because I understand what that means. So. I think that we think about exercise and intervention in, a, in the wrong way. Many people approach this as a zero-sum game issue where either I win, you lose, or you lose, I win. But really, I really think it's a non-zero game, zero-sum game. It's not as though there's a competition between treatments. No one has ever had a mud wrestling fight about thiazides versus Lasix, right? This just sounds stupid when you say it out loud. And so the idea that one treatment is better is, uh, and stands alone by itself and should cause the trashing of everything else is ridiculous. And so when I think about the conceptual framework, I don't really care if the dinosaurs were rendered extinct by an asteroid, asteroid or massive volcanic eruptions, or both. However I can get to the end zone is how I want to get there, to totally mix up metaphors. So. <clears throat> what we can see here, and what everybody in this room knows, is that intermittent claudication makes people feel terrible. So if you take a look at physical, physical component summary scores, uh, the average well adult sco scores somewhere in the range of about 55. 
the average adult about 50, and then we get moved down to the disease scores where chronic lung disease and congestive heart failure, uh, New York Heart Association Class 3, puts you between the 34 and 38 range. Patients with intermittent claudication fit right in there. They feel entirely disabled. So any way that we can move them closer to at least average adult is a good thing. And the question really is, is, is there any therapy individually that does that? So Michael mentioned to you the decision summary for, for supervised exercise. And I think that the most important part of this is that you can now offer it. Right? We used to ask people to go home and walk. We might as well have been asking them to go home and like build a gym where they live so they can have treadmills access for, with access for, to them. This is not like in Europe where there is much more access until now. <coughs> Now, I will say the last year or so has had a couple of hiccups. They wrote a decision memo incorrectly the first time. All this has been corrected, um, and you can get supervised exercise wherever there is uh, rehabilitation provided. All right, so I'm going to go a little bit more into Clever than uh, Michael did, as he mentioned. And there, this is not surprising data, okay? But as everybody remembers, with a three times per week walking program, that was supervised, the increase in walking distance was significantly greater with exercise than it was with stenting, and both were significantly greater than optimal medical therapy, which was basically solastazole, uh, and as we all know, has never been the cure-all for anything. However, um, I think it should be noted that the time to pain onset was actually better in the stenting arm. So basically people got, A, got used to walking with a bit of pain more, uh, and even though they could walk longer, the time until they got pain, which is really important, so people think about when will I have to stop because I'm getting pain in my legs, that actually took a longer period of time with the stenting arm than it did with the exercise arm. I think one of the key things, and this really uh, builds on what Michael was saying about what uh, patients like to do and don't like to do, is that the walking impairments uh, uh, questionnaire scores were much better for stenting. People were much happier with how they felt. This is another uh, questionnaire, same thing. Uh, and I want to make the point here that no matter which score we use, nobody gets to normal in either setting. So it's not like you give one therapy and someone's perfect. Now, ERASE answers the question, at least the question that I have in my mind is, are these therapies doing the same thing or are they complementary? Are they improving walking by doing different things to people so that the, the benefits may be aggregate rather than uh, uh, overlapping? And what you can see here <coughs> in the ERASE trial uh, is that here are the patients uh, on top who got both, revascularization versus supervised exercise alone, and the people who went on to need some kind of additional therapies was much lower in the group that got both up front. Not surprising. What I think is really interesting, and just take a look at the 12-month numbers down here, the uh, distance increase by ma uh, uh, for walking by exercise was about 955 meters, versus 1,237 meters for, for intervention plus exercise. Uh, and pain-free walking distance had the same kind of pattern. Again, 700 for the exercise versus 1,100 for both. And so these therapies clearly add on to each other. I'm not saying that there are some people who, get, who do exercise and, don't, and then don't need intervention. I'm sure there are some of those. Um, but there are also patients who will clearly gain benefit by having both therapies because I think they're complementary. In the quality of life measures, again, we see the same pattern that we saw before. First of all, whether you want to use the VAS, uh, VASQ qual score or the SF36 physical conditioning score, the scores increase dramatically in both, but they increase much more in the arm that had uh, both um, stenting and exercise compared to those that didn't. And so I think so far what I'm being able to tell you is that the combination of therapies in the right patients improves physical functioning and improves perception of, of wellness. I think we should start with supervised exercise, but I don't think that we should eliminate the possibility of revascularization 
if someone is still limited in their ability to walk because we can see that the therapies are additive. Now, I remember I had to talk about medical therapy, so I thought I'd put in one medical therapy slide. Um, this work is 20 years old now. Uh, this is, the best part about this study is that it compared salostazole to pentoxyphylin and placebo, and you can see here that over a course of repeated exercise tests, there was a significant increase in walking distance of salostazole compared to placebo um, of about um, 40, 40 uh, I think it's 40 meters, and pentoxyphylin did nothing. So do not use pentoxyphylin for this indication. So with that, what I'll say is that both supervised exercise and revascularization improve walking distance in aortoiliac disease. These treatments likely affect different pathophysiologic components as they together work better than they do alone. And the goal for therapy should be normalization of walking ability, not my therapy is better than yours. I would say you might as well throw on salazazole if the patient is a candidate for it. My real experience has been some people walk a lot better and almost half the people don't notice a change at all. With that, I'll say thanks, uh, and I'll, I look forward to talking to you when we're doing the panel. Uh, thank you, Josh. Our next speaker, uh, Dr. Jessica Titus, will be uh, talking about endovascular versus surgical approach, patient selection. Good morning, and uh, thank you to the committee for asking me uh, to present. I'm here today to talk about uh, open versus endovascular therapy for aortoiliac occlusive disease, choosing the right approach for the right patient. I have no disclosures. Uh, I do have one disclaimer, although I am a surgeon, these are two of my favorite cases, so I'm basically comparing an endo-ABF to an open ABF, um, so I'm duly biased. But uh, I think when you're looking at comparing two therapies, it's important to define the players you have, and you're really looking at uh, the outcome profile versus the risks the risk profile for each uh, individual patient. And so when you look at the historical gold standard, uh, aortobifemoral bifemoral bypass has really stood the test of time and has great five-year patency rates and even great patency rates out to uh, 10 years. Um, but this comes at the, at the risk of a substantial risk profile. And when you look at the complications associated with it, they are not insignificant. Um, the biggest ones being growing complications and sexual dysfunction as well as a significant risk of uh, myocardial infarction and even death, up to 4% in some series. Uh, there's also late complications. I think many of us have dealt with uh, limb thrombosis uh, not infrequently. And so with this risk profile, uh, there are a certain amount of patients that just can't withstand this therapy. And so uh, the alternative in the past has been an extra anatomic bypass. And when you look at the outcomes for them, even in the best of hands, it's pretty dismal, 51% five-year patency for an AX unifem and a FEMFEM bypass at 75%. And so with this, there's really been that unmet need for another therapy, and endovascular therapy has kind of rapidly evolved uh, with respect to uh, treatment of this. Um, looking back in 1964, Dodder and Judkins did the first uh, balloon angioplasty for stenosis, and from there, uh, really the treatment of the iliacs progressed with an 85 first defining the kissing technique for balloons. If you look, the technical success rates have been good for this, um, but the five-year patency wasn't very good. Uh, they then moved to using balloon expandable stents, and that improved patency, uh, but not uh, to the point where it could really compete. Uh, with open therapy yet. And then we started uh, exploring other kinds of stents, so self-expanding, especially for the external iliacs. And then in 1998, the Dutch iliac stent trial really solidified iliac stenting as a uh, valid therapy uh, with good clinical success rates at both two and five years. And so now when we look at our options for treating the patient who comes to us with aortoiliac occlusive disease, we have multiple therapies. And so the question really has become, how do you choose what's best for which patient? And out of this was born the, uh, the task classification. And by the time task one came out in 2000, it was already essentially obsolete. So they started preparing a new one. And in 2007, task two came out. 
Um, and this is the, the writing. I do better with pictures. And so this is the uh, picture profile of kind of the different classification scheme, obviously going from more simple lesions in A to uh, very complex ones in D. And when you look at the recommendations, they recommend an endovascular approach for uh, A's and then open for D's with uh, B and C kind of in the middle looking at different patient factors. Uh, World War II General MacArthur said rules mostly made to be broken and are too often for the lazy to hide behind. And I think he would be really proud of uh, of interventional and uh, vascular surgery in this respect because these are essentially the second test two was published. All of these papers have started coming out and they really haven't stopped. And these are all looking at treating really up to uh, test C and D lesions with very good results. So why have we been able to get these good results with endovascular therapy looking at the outcomes in the past? We've really progressed in our treatment of uh, first balloon angioplasty and then the consideration of stents and who should get a stent whereas who should get a balloon. As well as looking at stent types, I referred earlier to balloon versus self-expanding in different locations and defining where they're best used. And then also looking at covered versus bare metal. The graph to the right is a comparison study looking at a stent graph versus just a basic stent for the uh, iliacs. And you can see improved patency rates there. And then also looking at more physiologic reconstruction of the bifurcation. So this is three year uh, outcome data for the CEREB technique, which is more of a physiologic uh, reconstruction of the bifurcation. And then also looking at treating your outflow disease. And so if there's a component of common femoral disease, including that in your reconstruction improves your patency rates and outcomes. And so when you look at what factors help us to decide, I think there's a couple good papers that I pulled. This one's out of New England, looking at the durability of multi-segment occlusive disease. Because I think for a straightforward task A, task B, even task C lesions, we know that endo probably uh, is the first approach. But looking at multi-segment disease where you're treating multiple factors, what are your components that should point you one direction or the other? And in this study, they found that the external iliac artery lesion really contributed to decreased outcomes, even when it was treated, obviously, because if there's a lesion there, you're going to treat it. But patency rates, both primary and primary assisted, were significantly less when the external was involved. The other factors they found was a requirement for thrombolysis, which is likely just a surrogate for a long segment occlusion because of the thrombus in between the two caps of the lesions. Uh, interestingly, they had a couple uh, weird findings. Uh, male sex was higher risk, which is different than previously published studies. But when they looked at the males, uh, there was a heavy component of external disease in, in this population for their study. And so they thought it was from that. Also, the absence of cardiac disease, uh, which you would think the reverse was true. But what they found was uh, medical management was much better in those with known cardiac disease. They were on statins. They were on aspirins. Uh, whereas the just vascular component probably wasn't treated as well. And then looking at a study of uh, 5,300 patients, meta-analysis, all the way from 1989 to 2010, uh, they found kind of what we have over time open. Uh, the patients were slightly higher risk with poor pre-op runoff scores. Uh, they d had longer length of stay and more complications, uh, including mortality at 30 days. But along with this, uh, you got the benefit of uh, globally increased rates of primary patency. And so at one, three, and five years for both primary and secondary were better for open therapy. And so take home message is really, it's difficult to define absolute criteria for this. Nobody fits in a box very well. I think you need to consider each patient individually. But there are some factors to consider. When you look at a patient in the clinic, patient specific cardiopulmonary status, that may take open therapy off the table. And so you're gonna be deciding then between extra anatomic versus endovascular. And frankly, I would go to endovascular almost every time uh, over doing an extra anatomic bypass. That's kind of my absolute last resort. Um, age, if you have a real young patient, uh, we know the need for re-interventions is higher with endo, and so it may be better to do open on the front end. Uh, however, the caveat is that focal disease, endovascular is still first line consideration. Uh, so that one common iliac lesion, uh, I think most of us would still just go for a stent. Uh, gender, most studies demonstrate decrease in women, but as we saw the other study, uh, perhaps uh, it's less gender-based and more distribution of disease. 
and then looking at disease-specific factors, so severity, occlusions versus stenoses, long segment versus focal, uh, things that make endovascular approach a little bit more difficult. And then really considering involvement, if you have total occlusion of the entire external iliac artery on both sides, I think uh, your, your task is going to be a little bit more difficult endovascular and your patency may be less. And then looking at runoff disease uh, and then uh, the severity of their presenting symptoms. Thank you. So I would like to ask now uh, Peter Sukas to give his talk about excess site selection, retrograde, brachial, radial, when and why. Peter, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, certainly a pleasure and honor to be here again, and I certainly appreciate the uh, uh, organizers uh, inviting me back this year. So I have to actually apologize for the fact that I apparently used a version of PowerPoint that uh, causes a bunch of lines to, uh, to appear on the slide, so let me apologize for that ahead of time. I have no dis uh, uh, disclosures relevant to this presentation. So I'm really talking about access site selection for aortoiliac intervention and really talking about some general considerations. It's often evident where you should access based on your preoperative imaging, particularly if you've had a CT or an MRA. And by and large, we usually perform angiography from a retrograde common femoral access contralateral to the more symptomatic disease limb, uh, especially in those patients in whom we don't have preoperative imaging. But the bottom line for this presentation is going to be that location and nature of the lesion are really the primary determinants of access approach. So from a practical standpoint, common iliac artery stenoses are approached from a retrograde ipsilateral common femoral access, external iliac stenoses approached from a contralateral common femoral access. But proximal common iliac CTOs are generally approached from an antegrade, either brachial or radial approach, while external iliac CTOs are generally approached from a contralateral up and over CFA access, unless, of course, patient has had prior uh, aorta bifem, EVAR, or kissing aorta iliac stents, in which case you'd have to come from an antegrade arm approach. Um, in my practice, we use intravascular ultrasound, uh, uh, external ultrasound, rather, uh, guidance for all of our access, no matter what, coronary, peripheral, et cetera. Um, in terms of radial access, obviously that's really revolutionized PCI in the last decade, but it actually has become more and more popular in the periphery as well. And there are, of course, a number of uh, uh, advantages of uh, uh, radial access, less vascular complications, avoiding disease common femorals, patients can get up earlier, they're usually out of bed. Uh, quicker and get out of the hospital sooner, and hemostasis is easy and it's more comfortable. There are, however, some important limitations. Radial arteries are not big arteries. Uh, they're prone to spasm and tortuosity. We're very limited until very recently in terms of equipment length, and obviously there are certain things uh, you can't do with radial artery access like uh, big atherectomy catheters and so forth. So when contemplating whether or not to do it from the radial, I think it's important to really be careful about knowing your distances and how long uh, uh, your, your access site is from your lesion site and plan accordingly. Uh, fortunately now with the RTP uh, uh, Terumo products, we have sheaths that are up to 119 uh, centimeters with 200 centimeter balloons. And of course, these sheathless guides have really been very helpful in terms of allowing us to treat uh, more patients with bigger devices. Uh, it's important, of course, to use uh, uh, vasodilators very liberally, a lot of sedation. And in general, angiography non-selectively is performed with a 125 centimeter straight pigtail catheter and selective angiography with multipurpose and vertebral devices. Support catheters are important, obviously need long wires. And I just want to just jump in and show uh, uh, some, some cases here. This is a, uh, a patient who had occlusive instant resinosis of a, uh, a, a common iliac artery, initial angiogram performed with a 125 centimeter pigtail catheter, got a super core wire down there to deliver a 110 centimeter shuttle sheath, cross the lesion with a stiff glide, and then just balloon angioplasty with a very nice result. So this is obviously a quick and easy case to do from the wrist. Uh, this is a 63-year-old fem uh, female who basically came in with right thigh claudication. Didn't, interestingly, did not have a drop after four minutes of exercise in her ABI, so we thought she's probably going to have just a plain old stenosis. Uh, lo and behold, uh, she had a total occlusion of the right common iliac artery and a very calcified aortoiliac bifurcation. So the question is, how would you approach this? Well, a couple of options. You could go from the right groin retrograde, left up and over, or, or antegrade from above. 
In this case, uh, we're, I guess, lazy trying to hurry up and get through the case, try to retrograde submittable access. Of course, it didn't work, and I was like, God, I should have just gone from the arm. And then we did, uh, for the sake of completeness, try left up and over, and again, probably not the right access. And then finally, uh, came from the arm with a five French sheath and a vertebral catheter, were able to pop through this with a soft glide, crossed antegrade, duh, should have done this from the beginning. And then after exteriorizing the wire with a quick capture, we're able to then perform PTA, put some uh, kissing covered stents for the bifurcation, self-expanding stents, and we're able to get a very nice result. Uh, this is a morbidly obese gentleman who had had two prior unsuccessful attempts at traversal of the left external iliac CTO. And you can see it's rather extensive. Uh, below the uh, ingrown ligament, though, he had pretty much preserved uh, disease. So again, how would you approach this? So we did obtain, uh, put a small sheath in retrograde, uh, and with that degree of tortuosity, you needed a soft glide and a quick cross, and basically anchored in the uh, hypogastric, we're able to then get a seven French sheath up and over, used a crosser to try to get through there clean, we're able to get through, and then after that, it was pretty straightforward to just basically balloon and stent these, and he was uh, able to go home the same day, and thankfully is now um, claudication free. Another interesting case of a diabetic woman uh, who had uh, significant right calf claudication that had progressed up the leg, and you can see on her initial angiogram, she's got essentially flush occlusion there of the external iliac artery, which reconstitutes at the common femoral, and her runoff disease really was, was pretty benign. So the question is how to approach this. Well, you know, from an antegrade axis, there really wasn't any sort of a good peak or beak there to get in there. So we purposely went into the deep iliac circumflex branch with a micropuncture kit and were able to anchor a short sheath into the uh, uh, common femoral artery, and then uh, we're able to get through this with a crosser retrograde and then after, of course, confirming that we were intraluminal, went ahead and ballooned and stented that, and patient really had a very nice result and was rendered symptom-free. Uh, another case of a patient who had critical bilateral uh, internal carotid artery stenosis was referred by a vascular surgeon for carotid stenting. Uh, it just so happened that she also had some claudication, kind of poo-pooed that, so we brought her in for her carotid stent, and lo and behold, initial access shows that her common iliac is occluded. Uh, again, tried quickly retrograde, uh, I didn't learn my lesson from the last case, so I just took my medicine, went uh, left up and over, did an abdominal ortogram again confirming her common iliac occlusion. Uh, in this case though, she had a t decent stump, so we were able to just pass a glide wire through there, and then um, a snare from the right common femoral side, we're able to snare that, and then uh, redirect the wire into the uh, aorta, and then of course just finish up with some uh, balloon expandable and self-expanding stents with a very nice result uh, in the end. Uh, another patient uh, who presented with uh, unsuccessful attempt at a right common iliac CTO from a retrograde access, and in this particular case, uh, you can see uh, he does have a reasonable stump there, so we came from the arm from the get-go with a seven French brachial sheath, we're able to traverse that cleanly, and then after some adjunctive balloon angioplasty and stenting, we're able to reconstruct the bifurcation uh, with a very nice result. And so in summary, we can say that uh, in, in our practice, we always use ultrasound and micropuncture kits for access. Preoperative imaging obviously is very helpful to really define the anatomy and plan the case. But again, the location and the nature of, of the lesion are the primary determinants of the access approach. Again, iliac stenosis from retrograde up to lateral, uh, common iliac stenosis, external iliac stenosis from a contralateral up and over approach, proximal CTOs from above, and external iliac CTOs usually from an up and over approach, unless of course the patient's had a previous aorta by fem or kissing stents or iliac tortuosity. And I uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, next speaker, Dr. Uh, Nicholas Shamus, who will be talking uh, about a problem we all face every day, calcifications. All right, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. So when Subhash asked me to talk about uh, non-dilatable iliac lesions, you know, I thought, well, I usually send those to surgery, you know, and uh, so uh, we're going to make the non-dilatable lesions actually dilatable at this point. So let's see if that works. Okay. All right. So these are my disclosures. All right. So let's get the, the scope of the problem up to one-third of our lesions are going to be iliac uh, interventions. 
Uh, we have seen calcified iliac artery disease, you know, up to 60% of patients. Uh, and the potential problem with severe calcium is very obvious to all of you, you know, crossing, dilating the lesion, the risk of complications, uh, and of course, uh, the acute and long-term outcome could be affected. So if you look at a small study, but very informative, you know, looking at heavy calcium and how it affects stent expansion and patency, in 13 patients, 14 heavily calcified disease, you can see the residual narrowing post-treatment was almost 50%, 47.9% in those very heavy calcified disease. Hemodynamic success was not very uh, good, was about 60%, uh, and clinical success was about 78%. Uh, Interestingly, however, the vessels, you know, really stayed open, you know, at 33 months despite uh, hemodynamic, uh, you know, uh, compromise. Uh, again, uh, hemodynamically significant residual stenosis and incomplete expansion of the stent. So what are, what are the type of approaches we can take? Balloon expandable versus self-expandable? So we look at uh, 660 patients that involved uh, about one in five uh, or one in four heavily calcified disease, and the self-expanding stent, interestingly, were good. Uh, they actually led to better results with the less re uh, and better freedom from TLR, but not, not a whole lot of differences uh, in the clinical outcome. And uh, when you start looking at uh, the heavy calcification and its impact on these results in multivariate analysis, it didn't really make much difference. So, uh, you know, the choice uh, of a covered stent here versus a non-covered stent uh, came from various registries. If you look at the ICARES registry, we had 60% severe calcification, and the primary patency was very good, 95.1%, with a TLR rate of 2.9%. You can see also from the barred live stream, you know, registry, again, severe calcification was in 64%. And if you look at the data, primary patency was still good, 92.8% and a TLR rate of 4.3%. The VBX uh, flex cap, uh, stent had very good data, but not a whole lot on severe calcified disease, even though complex disease fared very well, and a lot of those were calcified. So if you look at uh, the freedom from binary restenosis and the task C and D lesions with the covered stent, it seems to behave very well, and a lot of us believe that complex disease, uh, particularly calcified disease, do very well with those covered stents, even though some data just re uh, recently published telling us that there is a higher rate of one-year repeat intervention in those vessels, and that's uh, uh, involving 162 patients, uh, again, retro uh, retrospective data, so we have to take uh, that uh, into consideration. Uh, Meta-analysis recently published showing that uh, no difference in primary patency at one, two, three, and up to five years with uh, covered stent versus bare metal stents. Uh, however, that meta-analysis qualified uh, the conclusion saying that uh, covered stents, you know, may improve patency rate despite actually the data pointing otherwise. So where is the importance of covered stents in that case? It's the pave and crack technique really in those severe calcified disease. Initially described by the Sweden group uh, in iliac arteries and later applied in, or actually recently applied in calcified FEMPOP arteries, you line the arteries with a covered stent, full coverage, you know, with the uh, Sweden group, they advised even covering the iliac arteries where they thought at that location there's a highest rate of rupture, and aggressive balloon dilatation. So the advantage less perforation when high pressures are deployed, in the FEMPOP that was used as a step prior to implantation of a superior stent, and in the iliac artery was described as pre-aortic iliac stent graft deployment. So this is kind of an example of how the stent can be fully expanded despite very heavy calcification, uh, allowing uh, aortic stent grafts to be deployed right through it. So a strategy for vessel prepping of severe calcified, you know, the vessel prepping for severe uh, calcium in iliac arteries may be, however, important rather than just throwing in stents and using very high pressure balloons. You know, it allow better stent expansion, it allow better hemodynamics, and will allow better clinical outcome. So, atherectomy, let's look at atherectomy in the iliacs. Limitations, safety data are very limited, perforations can be catastrophic, bulky lesions can carry high risk of distal embolization, and effectiveness is limited by the device type and the size it's an off-label application in the U.S., and it's not reimbursable. However, if you look at some data from orbital atherectomy and a retrospective analysis of 85 iliac arteries in 79 patients, you can see that in those very calcified disease, you know, you had good mean stenosis reduction of 39%, and post-adjunctive angioplasty was all the way down to 11%. Stents were only placed in 44% in that study. 
Complications were relatively very low. Acute thrombosis was in 1%, uh, dissections in 5%, and perforation only in 1%. This was actually confirmed by the orbital atherectomy confirmed sub-analysis in 68 lesions, 62 patients, where the rate of perforations was only 1.5%, and reported vessel closure was 1.5%. The over-procedural complication rate was significantly lower in that iliac group compared to the application of the same technique in severe calcified uh, FEMPOP disease. So this is a nice uh, illustration uh, on uh, when you use orbital atherectomy in severely calcified uh, disease, almost 360-degree calcification, followed by balloon angioplasty. Very nice expansion by IVUS, and you can also see the reverberations, you know, that become more apparent, uh, you know, following the treatment, indicating some form of uh, lesion modification. So what about using other newer techniques like the shock wave? The shock wave can be effective. It treats superficial and deep calcium, and it's approved actually for iliac applications. You know, some limitations is balloon size, particularly for common iliac arteries. And at that time, at this particular time, we don't have really good data, uh, but it just kind of makes common sense. We, it has been used already for assisted transfemoral aortic valve implantation to allow better iliac vessel expansion uh, for those large uh, sheath. Uh, this is an example actually from our lab where severe calcified disease in the external iliac uh, and there was some calcification right in the common femoral artery. By IVUS, however, these were mostly superficial. This was very significant and using lithoplasty right in this case, followed by stenting, you can see very widely expanded stent and by IVUS it showed almost full expansion of that stent. And this is the calcium prior to the treatment. So again, severe calcified iliac artery lesions negatively affect stent expansion, hemodynamics, and clinical outcomes. And the evidence of vessel prep in iliac arteries is lacking, but there is some off-label uh, application of orbital atherectomy and shock wave, or even both, appear to be feasible. Covered stent followed by high-pressure balloon dilatation, the pave and crack technique, is also a reasonable option. Thank you. Thank you. This was a very important uh, talk, and uh, I believe we can discuss in, in depth later on. I would like to ask now my co-moderator, um, <clears throat> Dr. Rasavi, to give his talk about the application of re-entry systems in the autoiliac location. M Mahmoud, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, again, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so uh, the, the subject uh, this morning is the application of, of uh, uh, reentry devices in the aortoiliac disease. So that means, by by uh, nature, uh, the uh, these are difficult cases that we've not been able to do. And most of the uh, devices that people use are these two, basically Outback and the Pioneer. The other ones have also been used and have also been reported. And I'll show you some examples of some of these. Uh, they they uh, obviously uh, fit certain anatomies better than other. Now, there's not a whole lot in the literature, unfortunately, in the subject. The, the, the literature is rather scant. Now, this is one of the earliest reports. This, I actually haven't been able to find an earlier one than this. Uh, it came from our group uh, looking at what is now called Pioneer. This is other uh, uh, sample literature. Uh, as you can see, the number of patients are very few. Uh, that have been reported in the literature, and they talk mostly about technical success, and the long-term success, even less data on that. And the pool technical success is pretty high. So not bad for, pa for patients that we cannot get reentry uh, in the usual fashion, uh, then, then you can improve your success rate uh, to almost, you know, better than 90%, close to 100% if you use reentry devices. Now, another disclosure here is that I really don't like uh, reentry devices in the uh, iliac arteries for the reasons that become uh, 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 evident in a second. Let's show some example. 80-year-old man, Lerouche syndrome, aortoiliac occlusion. Uh, here's a CT scan, as you can see, this aorta is occluded. Here are some angiograms. This was done by one of our colleagues. And uh, access was obtained into both uh, iliac arteries and, and uh, uh, tried to recanalize in the aorta, but in the aorta we were not in the same lumen. And so obviously it's easy to take, in this case, uh, is a outback catheter, and uh, reentry was obtained, angioplasty was done, and then uh, basically you create a double lumen aorta and iliac into the uh, stent into the iliac arteries and reestablish anti-grade flow. 
Here's one of our cases. Now you can see that this is a stiffening cannula. This is actually happens to be a transjugular liver biopsy set that we're using here. And the reason we use that in the case of aortic dissection, because most of these other reentry devices, you need something to push it off the back wall of the vessel. And in aortic dissection, you don't always have that. And so you have to use something like this. And uh, of course, to, to, to the uninitiated, when you put a biopsy set into the aorta, they all leave the room. But that's OK. Um, and, and you can actually, uh, uh, being guided with the balloon, uh, get uh, across angioplasty, stent, and the usual uh, uh, sort of steps uh, follow. Now, use of Pioneer, again, flush occlusion, uh, uh, and, and bilateral common femoral artery access could not get in, and here you can see the, the Pioneer uh, accessing and the second wire passed, and then the usual steps follow. Angioplasty on the left, and then post standing on the right. Now, the problem with all of these cases that I showed you, not a problem, or at least the approach was, the, the, the double barrel aorta was created with stenting like this. Again, same as veins, I actually prefer to put a big stent in the main vessel and then kissing a stent if we can. Not always possible in some of the cases you saw, but the, 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 uh, uh, the scheme to your right is actually my personal preference if we can. So how do we do that in these types of situations? Using reentry devices. One is the strategic reentry. Don't go up into the aorta where you have to raise the bifurcation because then if you ever need to come back up and over in these patients, it's going to be very difficult. As in this case, this was a case of Andrew Blum. As you can see, he managed to enter right at the bottom and uh, stented it, kissing his stent, and didn't have to raise the aortic bifurcation a whole lot at all. The other uh, technique or approach would be if you uh, fail uh, uh, one side, you can come from the other. And even if you fail the other side, so that's where you want to use a reentry is you put a balloon in there, although you have not re-entered, and then use your re-entry device to hit the balloon. Therefore, what this allows you to do is to stay away from the aortic bifurcation. And therefore, you can put a stent in there and not to have to raise the aortic bifurcation at all. Look, this case is an example of that. Same thing, coming from one side unsuccessful, coming from the other side unsuccessful, we use a balloon-assisted re-entry and uh, access was obtained. Now, if you have occlusion lower down, that's even more important to do the same thing because you could compromise profunda coming that way if you're in the subintimal fashion. I have no problem hitting the SFA in these locations. In fact, we commonly do. We don't approach it through common femoral. We hit the SFA, and we come back up, do the same strategy. Now, either balloon or a stent, now you have a target to come from the other side. And then you come from the other side, you, know, uh, you can either use reentry or your usual fashion to get in there. And here's a situation, flush occlusion of the common, uh, of the, uh, uh, common iliac. Uh, and uh, as you can see now, our uh, efforts from the below have been unsuccessful. We're clearly in the subentimal space on that image on the right. So we did the same thing. From up, from down, put a balloon down below, reentry got back in, stented it, and both profunda and internal iliac artery saved. Didn't have to compromise neither the internal iliac artery nor the profunda, both of which are diseased. Now, the, this is uh, a case that uh, was iliac stented already, and as you can see, there's a reconstitution of the common femoral. There happens to be a profunda here also, but the profunda flow is retrograde, so you won't see it in the injections here when we inject uh, anti-grade. Um, so again, we uh, approached this through the SFA, uh, unsuccessful from the top, uh, approached that from the SFA, and I spare you the details of how we got up into the bottom of that stent, but the problem was we could not break the cap up at the top into the aorta. Anything that you said we used could not get in. From the other side was also unsuccessful, so, so we used a, a uh, uh, if I could get this going, there we go a transeptal needle set. And you just put it in there, not hard to break through, and boom, we just broke through, okay? Now, you, the, the rest of it is basically what we just talked about. Angioplasty, stenting, get the flow going again. So in conclusion, failure of crossing in the iliac uh, segments are more common than the FEMPOP. If you look at the scant literature there is, but you, use of reentry devices can actually improve the success rate quite a bit. Thank you. Okay, uh, next speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Trinidad, who will be talking to us about uh, using uh, endograph to treat occlusive aortic disease.
Perfect. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, organizing committee <clears throat> for inviting me to participate. Uh, we're going to talk about the use of uh, stent grafts to treat aortic occlusive disease, uh, namely stent grafts that are meant to be used or were designed primarily for the use of aneurysmal disease. So we know that aortic disease is prevalent, and as a population ages, you will see more and more. Simply take a look back at the number of procedures that have been done for aortoiliac interventions over the last two decades, and those numbers have increased dramatically. <clears throat> the symptoms that these patients present with range from simple claudication all the way up to critical limb ischemia. Now, traditionally, the gold standard has been surgical bypass, as you saw in an earlier talk, and it has having a higher primary patency, but at the expense of some morbidity. As technology has advanced and become more, more available, the endovascular reconstructions have been able to afford a result that has similar secondary patency with much less morbidity. <clears throat> and just to be clear, uh, I'm referring in this section to patients with task C and task D uh, anatomical classifications. Historically, the surgical bypass has been done in the configuration of aorta bifemoral or aortoiliac. And a review of pooled data over the last uh, 30 years um, shows that there has been a change in 30-day mortality between 2.7 and 3.6 percent. So if you take the, over the last 30 years, you take the 1985, 15 years after that, and then the last 15 years, there has been some changes. There's been a decrease in primary patency between 93.3 and 82.2 percent. Primary assisted patency is also a little bit different compared to historical controls, as well as secondary patency in limb salvage. And this is mostly due to the fact that the population is older, and also because surgical bypass, in many instances, is now being used as a secondary option for salvage after failed endovascular intervention. <clears throat> and why is there so much morbidity in patients with surgical bypass? Well, take a look at this. The more complex reconstructions are the ones that are being done nowadays where you need to require a super renal clamp or even sometimes a super seal clamp to protect things from embolizing. If you look at this picture, for instance, this patient has occlusion all the way to the renal arteries and has, uh, uh, you can see how here the crusted diaphragm has been divided in order to achieve cert, uh, the control. And then when you end up opening the aorta, you can see all this intramural thrombus. Sometimes you can find the stent graft in there with all these, all these um, uh, contents. And if embolization occurs, and uh, you can see this all the way down in the foot, imagine what happens if it goes to the intestine or the liver or the renal organs. <clears throat> now, if you think about endovascular intervention, the first modality that came about in, in this fashion were the kissing stents. And more recently, the CRAP technique has been described. Technical success in these patients varies greatly, and that's due to the earlier heterogeneous uh, configuration of the groups reported. The 30-day mortality has re been reported between 0% and as high as 6.7%, morbidity between 3% and 46%. And why is that? That's because it depends on what type of morbidity people are reporting. Some series report even ecchymosis of the skin as a, co as a complication of morbidity, whereas some series only report major adverse cardiovascular events. <clears throat> Primary patency ranges between 70 and 97% in different uh, studies. And again, that also depends on the time frame that they're looking at. I don't think any of these are reporting five-year data uh, patency as we have for historical controls and, and bypass. And secondary patency has also been reported with a great variability. Kissing stents were the first iteration of this type of modality. The patency rates in recent reviews vary between 79 and 48 percent, and actually being much lower in patients with TAS-D classifications. And that difference in, in patency rates at, through the timeline is due to the fact that people are tackling more and more complicated lesions as time has gone by. The uh, decrease in patency can also be uh, attributed to cross limb formation, which decreases patency. There can be a radial mismatch associated with failure. The, another disadvantage is racing the bifurcation. And more recently, the CRAP technique or, or um, uh, covered endovascular uh, 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 reconstruction of aortic bifurcation has been a progression from the kissing stents. 
Now this has been mostly described with the uh, use of the AFX stent graft, but there are reports of using bifurcated grafts. If you think of the AFX graft, uh, think of it as an inverted Y that has been meant for, uh, uh, for aneurysmal disease. It's, an it's a unibody with endoskeleton, so the fabric is actually on the outside, which then affords to prevent infolding. There are no limbs competing in the narrow distal aorta. You preserve the bifurcation with this, in, in this fashion, and then, in theory, it avoids the possibility of missing a common iliac lesion because the stent is sitting all the way into the common iliac arteries. And like I said, some series have been also, uh, uh, have also been reported utilizing bifurcated stent grafts, which are more traditional uh, stents. Take, for instance, this type of uh, aortic occlusion. This patient was all, all taken care of with a retrograde recanalization through the femoral arteries, utilizing techniques that were described in the previous talk. In other, in other cases, when there are, where there's, the distal aorta is uh, involved as well, then retrograde and antegrade techniques can be utilized. And for instance, this last patient is a 79-year-old woman, he had a 4.8 centimeter aneurysm associated with the occlusive disease. So probably, she's not a candidate for open surgical reconstruction, and, but something had to be done for her. And so this patient was actually treated after uh, crossing the lesions with an ovation stent graft. And sometimes the, it's the distal aorta that dictates what type of graft you're going to use. In her case, she had a thrombus-laden neck, and so we felt that in her, in, in this, in her case, an ovation graft with uh, less manipulation would have been better to treat the, uh, to treat the neck and that, and to accommodate that anatomy. In conclusion, uh, the CRAP technique requires a high level of skill and the use of many uh, complex techniques as you've, seen, as you've seen in previous talks. It is a good alternative for surgical high-risk patients. Primary assisted and secondary patency rates are comparable to historical controls. And don't forget that surgical reconstruction for failed CRAP or endovascular techniques is still an option with results that are very similar to historical controls. Thank you. So the next talk is dealing with another indication for stent graft implantation. The talk will be given by Dr. Parik, perforated iliac, how to bail out myself. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Zeller. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and uh, this is a, a topic that I, I think I'm an expert in is getting into and out of trouble. Uh, and I'll show a case as an example. Um, that will sort of illustrate some of the key points. Uh, and, and those points are uh, principally that whenever doing an iliac occlusive case, uh, we need to be prepared uh, to manage a complication. We need to be able to properly uh, do volume resuscitation for those of us that are not surgeons. Uh, that means to, to go big uh, with your volume resuscitation and then uh, understand how to obtain hemostasis temporarily while you're de developing your plan for definitive treatment uh, with a covered stent in general. So let me start with a case. This is a, a, from a few years ago. It's a, a patient who has an extensive cardiovascular history um, who'd had claudication and came in with an acute MI uh, was treated. And at the time of that, um, he had angiography, aortography, and runoff done uh, that demonstrated a, uh, a lesion akin to what you've been seeing from my uh, other speakers this morning. Uh, total occlusion of the left uh, common iliac with uh, high-grade disease and, and what doesn't represent well is that there's modest to moderate calcium uh, bilaterally. Uh, and this is a, an unsubtracted run where you can see uh, maybe a little bit of calcium. So I uh, hadn't attended Dr. Rosvi's uh, lecture, but at the time um, we were also doing a sub reentry, re-entry. Uh, and you can see here we went with a retrograde approach. Perhaps I should have listened to uh, Dr. Sukas and gone from the arm, but we uh, went from a retrograde approach uh, and were sub uh, in, in multiple projections. And so uh, we used the Pioneer Plus device and were able to re enter, and then we did a soft balloon dilatation. And I think, given the title of my talk, you're going to anticipate what happens next. Uh, at first, it looks like we're okay, but then we, we try to go in with a right size balloon. Um, and, uh, and, and establish a channel, we have a perforation. So th this, at this moment, uh, the first thing to do, and whenever we do these cases, you can see here we have a long right tip sheath 
um, that's been pulled back as we're doing inflation. So the bright tip that we start with is always seven French uh, for a reason, and I'll go through that in a moment. And we always leave the balloon on the wire uh, just in case, uh, because the next thing we do need to do in addition to uh, volume resuscitation is to get hemostasis. So with respect to volume resuscitation, I think one thing that we as interventional cardiologists don't do well is prepare uh, for some of these uh, potential complications by having a type and cross and blood available. And so we're frequently uh, left needing to get emergent uncrossed blood, but certainly getting crystalloid resuscitation and then having blood available relatively uh, quickly is important. So when you're doing these cases, uh, I try not to do them ad hoc, uh, and I try to make sure that we have blood available. Um, there isn't really no, any guidance on the volume that's required, but you need to, to resuscitate the patient adequately, and for those of us that are cardiologists, we, de we tend to underdo it uh, in general. Um, and then uh, there's a, a typical sort of vagal type of response, sort of almost Bezel jarish like where you get uh, blood in the retroperitoneum that causes a, a vagal response with vasodilatation and hypotension and relative bradycardia often that needs to be watched. So balloon tamponade, the first thing to do is always to get your balloon that you did your inflation with, which was hopefully right-sized, and inflate to get hemostasis. Now, in this case, after about 10 minutes of doing this and scratching our heads, uh, we were not able to seal the perforation. So the next thing is, is a covered stent. Uh, but before you do that, um, in addition to balloon tamponade of the ipsilateral limb, it's important to know your options for aortic occlusion, particularly if you're getting in trouble and you think you're going to need to go to the OR and have a friend help you. Uh, with the case. There's two uh, large balloons that are commonly used here in the United States, uh, the Coda balloon and the Reliant balloon, both used for, for endografts primarily. Um, but it's important to note that these are large bore access devices. Uh, and so if one is going to do aortic occlusion, you're going to need contralateral access that will accommodate a large bore device. Uh, and that's not always uh, uh, simple in, in these patients. So here's, in our case, uh, we, we were able to get a, uh, at the time, an ICAST stent, and you can see there's still some retrograde dissection uh, ascending the aorta, but the, the perf is not completely contained. It's a little bit hard to appreciate on this DSA, but we have some tracking of blood outside the iliac uh, going up. Uh, and so you might consider other covered stents, but so the self-expanding platforms that are available uh, that are commonly used, uh, the Vibon is probably the most common, and you have to recognize that if you call for a Vibon, they come in two different flavors. Uh, one is an 018 platform, and the other is the 035 platform. The 018 platform uses a smaller sheath compatibility, so you can go as small as six French for a five to six millimeter Vibon, and seven to eight millimeters requires seven French if you choose the 018 platform. The 035 platform is at least one French size bigger. If you need to go bigger than that, a 9 goes through a 9, a 10 and 11 goes through an 11, and a 13 goes through a 12. Um, so uh, basically one to one based on the size and diameter of the vessel. And this is critically important when you're calling in, in, a, in a panic uh, that you need a covered stent. We've already heard about the live stream. This is the size matrix just for your, uh, for your reference, but uh, the lengths go up to 58, and 8 French compatible can get you up to 12. Um, and more recently is the, the VBX from Vibon, and what's really attractive about this is that um, they're uh, 5 to 11 millimeter nominal diameter, uh, which can be post dilated all the way up to 16, and you can get a 16 post dil diameter through an 8 French axis. And uh, for most iliacs, an 11 through a 7 uh, will get you, uh, get you uh, out of trouble. And the lengths are quite long, up to 79 millimeters. So to be truthful, uh, in this situation, had we the, uh, the VBX, we might have chosen that uh, device uh, at the time. Uh, you've already heard about the uh, AFX device and other uh, um, endografts that might be uh, applicable in this kind of situation, but I think it's unlikely that you would choose this in an uh, emergency kind of scenario. So here in this patient, uh, we still had persistent leak, um, and we weren't done because there was still ongoing leak. The patient was well resuscitated, uh, but we couldn't really identify where the leak was. So we uh, post-dilated the first stent and uh, caused more trouble. Uh, and then we extended the stent uh, after a balloon tamponade with another stent. Um, and uh, we still had persistent leak, as you'll see. It's a little bit hard to tell, but you can see there is ongoing leakage here. At which point we, we uh, obtained uh, um, uh, crossover. We had two balloons up in a kissing fashion to, to get aortic occlusion and then serially deflated and, and uh, upsized. Uh, so we put 11 French sheets bilaterally uh, and were able to pre-close because we were able to do it uh, relatively quickly uh, and then uh, deployed uh, two Vibons. You can see, so there's 
a, a covered stent, a covered stent, and then a long Viabon from the A-word down in sort of a double barrel technique. And this was the final result um, after doing that. But each step required that we were prepared uh, to manage the complication. The first important step was that we used seven French initially, so uh, had we uh, the, the need, we were able to put a covered stent. Unfortunately, that wasn't enough with a balloon expandable stent, and so we had to, to go with, uh, with uh, an upsize technique and use, um, use the Viabon. I think in today's world, the VBX is a great alternative. You can, through seven French, get up to 11 millimeters in diameter, up to 79 millimeters in length, and get yourself out of trouble. Um, this patient did very well, went home first post-operative day, uh, and is still doing well. Thanks very much. Great. Our uh, next speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Karim Harth, uh, common femoral and interferoliac disease uh, hybrid approaches. Thank you. All right, thanks so much to the committee for inviting me uh, to this meeting and to give a presentation. I have no disclosures. So I was asked to give a presentation on a com combined disease in a patient with both aorta iliac and common femoral disease. And for me, as a vascular surgeon, this is really the ideal candidate for a hybrid approach. So we'll review a couple of cases. Uh, I'll consider and discuss some of the uh, decisions and, and leading to the, the approach I took and some of the outcomes for these patients. So the first is a 72-year-old female who actually um, came to me for a DVT management in my clinic. She's obese, poorly controlled diabetes. She was currently on Xarelto for the management of her DVT. She had a left leg swelling and in this setting had a venous wound. She had already been on Xarelto for a month, so this wound was there for some time. She had a duplex showing a femoral popliteal DVT. And actually, when speaking with her, she told me her wound started about two months prior, starting with a blister in the posterior calf on the left. And additionally, after much trying to probe the history, she reported some foot pain and numbness as well. Ultimately, all of this took her out of her home, placed her in a nursing home for inability to take care of herself. She had described an intervention which I wasn't really quite understanding, but certainly was a poor historian. And on exam, she had a pulseless left leg, so not just a venous problem, all the way from her groin to the foot. She had barely venous phase signals at the foot, some significant swelling, and otherwise had a normal right leg on exam. So here are some pictures of the patient. Um, clearly an atypical wound, not a typical venous wound, a very extensive large wound. Um, we had our vascular lab right next to the clinic, so I took her straight to the lab and got some non-invasive uh, studies to confirm and document what my exam uh, had a high suspicion for, which is an inflow problem. She had normal waveforms on the right and essentially was in critical limb ischemia on the left with no uh, pulsatile waveform or decent waveform at the femoral level and an ABI of 0 0.12. Given her history and unclear uh, interventions at outside institutions for a patient like this, uh, my approach is to get a CTA if I have the luxury and the time to do so. We got her a CTA within 24 hours prior to admitting her to the hospital for additional intervention. Here are some cuts of her CTA. Uh, this is a, a picture of her iliac bifurcation. Uh, there's some disease, but another otherwise open uh, proximal part of the common iliac artery. This was, uh, you know, what wasn't very clear on the story, which was she had had a previous left common iliac stent, which was obviously occluded. Uh, this went down to the level of the hypogastric artery, and she reconstituted to uh, a, a di very distal external iliac artery just above the circumflex vessels, and what appeared, at, you know, could be interpreted as some common femoral artery disease uh, versus an underperfused vessel. So for a patient like this, first I'd like to assess uh, what the problem is. To me, she had something that's not very typical. She both, she had an inflow problem uh, stemming from her uh, certainly iliac disease and possibly a common femoral disease. And I think the wound progressed so quickly because she had, and it was atypical, because she also had an outflow problem. So we have a patient with both CLI and DVT. For me, the goal was to heal a high calf wound and get her out of rest pain. So um, I was gonna focus on her inflow disease. She also did have some popliteal occlusive disease. So when I think about a patient like this, 
Um, I try to think of what the best approach is to give me the best success. So when I thought about her, um, just based on CTA imaging alone, prior to any angiography, I thought, well, we can certainly take her to the operating room, go through a left groin approach, do an endarterectomy, patch angioplasty, and attempt a retrograde iliac recanalization with a bailout procedure of an anti-grade approach being the right groin or the left brachial. Or I can go straight from the right groin access, doing, uh, trying to cannulate that small uh, proximal common iliac artery from an anti-grade approach uh, with intervention, and then take uh, angiography to determine if my common, uh, common femoral artery lesion is uh, significant or not. Certainly a left brachial approach is a good option as an anti-grade recanalization technique. Um, gets you out of the groin if there's a groin issue, and then similarly evaluate the common femoral and decide if you need to do a groin cut down to reconstruct that portion of it. And ultimately, <clears throat> if you think it's not an option to recanalize that iliac in your practice, um, a, a fem fem extraanatomic bypass is an option, but certainly the least resort and something I haven't done since fellowship. So for this approach, I, I chose option B. And why did I do that? Really, it was uh, mostly because of a device selection. Um, I've had uh, some success using this uh, steerable device, uh, which uh, comes in 6.5 to 8.5 French uh, internal diameter. Uh, it's the tour guide. It's a steerable sheath. It gives you the uh, support uh, when you have not a lot of purchase on the inflow side. It can steer up to 180 degrees, and you can uh, rotate it right and left, depending on which side you're working on. And um, so if it's a seven French inner diameter that you're looking for, the outer diameter is about almost a 10 French, so uh, that's something to consider when you're gaining access. Additionally, this patient had a groin folliculitis on the right side, so I wanted to stay away from that. I knew from my CT angiogram and from her waveforms that she had a normal uh, superficial femoral artery, and um, I also wanted to have an angiography uh, of the left common femoral artery before I committed her to an open groin approach and an open exploration on the left. So I did a small cut down over the superficial femoral artery to get this device up and over, and I knew that I would be fixing the uh, superficial femoral artery with a couple of stitches on the way out. So to me, that was my safe approach. So here are some pictures uh, showing what we came in, um, what we saw when we got in. So uh, my sheath is uh, coming in from the very uh, proximal part of the superficial femoral artery. She had an, uh, confirming the occluded uh, left common iliac artery. Once I got my um, uh, sheath up and over, I was able to get into this small nubbin of the proximal common iliac artery uh, with this tour guide device and able to get strong support uh, by rotating that uh, portion of the uh, sheath to 180, almost um, 180 degrees. I was able to hook that part of the sheath and then from there um, we were able to stay true lumen, stay within the stent, not go outside the stent and using a combination of stiff glide, quick cross uh, catheters, I was able to get down to the external iliac artery where uh, she was back in true lumen and patent. And at this time, actually, what I can not, was a little bit surprising to me, truthfully, because I had her left groin all propped out, was that her disease was really not that significant at the common femoral artery level, and it was likely a combination of a little bit of posterior plaque on the CT and um, an underperfused vessel on CTA. So from this uh, point forward, we uh, proceeded with balloon angioplasty uh, and uh, placed cover stents into her, uh, co within the uh, old stents into the common iliac artery into the external iliac artery, and balloon dilated that to a good common femoral and good profunda. So I stopped there. I, again, for me, for this patient, my goal is to heal a proximal calf wound. Uh, this is an image and, and some pictures of comparing her pre-imaging uh, vascular lab studies, the wound, um, and where she's at after about six months of therapy uh, with continued therapy for her uh, DVT and um, on uh, antiplatelet therapy, and her wound is healing quite nicely. She's out of rest pain and she's doing well. So we will save the fempop lesion for later. Here's another patient, 65-year-old male with a history of a right external iliac artery stenting and right SFA stenting for short distance claudication. This was quite remote and he was doing very well. Recently he had worsening left leg pain and symptoms and actually uh, when you asked and probed him a little bit more, he actually was describing some early rest pain and paresthesias. He had undergone an angiography. Those are his medical history. He has mild chronic kidney disease and this is his pre-op waveforms. So in an angiography um, from a right groin approach, you could tell he had 
Um, this was with the catheter slightly into the common iliac artery orifice, and there was a pretty dense uh, calcified plaque of the common iliac artery orifice, an otherwise uh, patent common iliac artery, and then very extensive, bulky, heavy uh, calcific disease at the external iliac artery. Um, further uh, look distally around the level of the femoral head here showed that there was heavy plaque burden uh, calcified disease at the common femoral artery, but really uh, occlusive disease into profunda and the proximal part of the superficial femoral artery. Distally on the angiography, he did have uh, some tandem lesions on the SFA, but an otherwise open SFA. The proximal part of the uh, superficial femoral artery occlusive occlusion was about two to three centimeters based on CTA and very heavy calcific disease. So for me, again, this was a patient who had worsening claudication and early rest pain, multi-level disease. Uh, and for me, again, a goal was to get inflow disease um, given the, the heavy burden of calcium at the iliacs and the common femoral artery bifurcation. So lots of ways to think about this case, but for me, I really just had two. One was to approach the groin, uh, do a left common femoral and extensive profundoplasty with reconstruction and at that same time do a retrograde iliac approach and uh, possibly go ahead and uh, address the SFA at the same time or do the extensive uh, inflow procedure to the profunda iliac and then save the SFA for later. So I chose B, um, leaving the SFA for later and actually did quite a bit of work in his groin and went up a couple of centimeters into the external iliac artery. So he essentially, from the groin, had a distal external iliac endoterectomy, common femoral endoterectomy, profundoplasty, uh, reconstructed that, and I also did an endoterectomy into his SFA for about two to three centimeters, and patchplasty that. Uh, this is kind of a picture depicting the extent of the patches and how they uh, wide down to the common femoral artery bifurcation. Here's an image of um, pre stent So before I started my endoterectomy, we placed a micro needle up, got a microwire up, took a picture just to get me into a, a visual picture of what the true lumen looked like, and I was able to uh, get my wire up, take a proper anagrade picture. Here's that heavy, uh, bulky plaque at the common iliac level, extensive disease at the external iliac. Really from the groin, there was no clampable vessel. If I had put a clamp in the external iliac above the circumflex vessels, we would have crushed his artery and really gotten ourselves into trouble. So for this approach, I do an over-the-wire Fogarty embolectomy for proximal uh, occlusion, and this allows me to do a clampless uh, inflow control while I do the endarterectomy. It also allows me to get my clamp up high into the external iliac artery and essentially do an eversion, almost an eversion endarterectomy of the uh, external iliac artery about halfway up. Um, we maintained our wire axis through our patch and then proceeded with the iliac intervention. Um, and at the end, here is what we have. We have our stent up in the common iliac and a very extensive endarterectomy with continued stenting of the external iliac artery. Our patch angioplasty into an open profunda, and this is kind of the patch into the uh, superficial femoral artery uh, with some flow distal. So currently he's about a couple months out. He's doing quite well. He's on dual antiplatelet therapy and actually regained both pulses. His ABIs are near 0.9, and he is completely out of pain, so I think we'll save the SFA for later. So take home points from a couple of these patients with uh, both uh, femoral and iliac diseases that, um, for me, a CTA is a nice roadmap for both complex aorta iliac, multi-level disease patient, but certainly I make no plans until I get my angiography, and then I proceed with a final decision. After assessing the patient disease, focus on the goal you're trying to achieve for the patient, as you can always stage the patient with additional revascularizations down the road as needed. When the inflow problem extends into the groin, I think adopting a hybrid approach is a very good way to do this. When doing a hybrid procedure with a groin, open groin, consider a technique that will facilitate addi uh, additional needed interventions down the line. So we say don't burn bridges, but this is almost like building a bridge for later. And so I, I do choose to uh, get into the SFA a little bit when I need to. And then follow your patients closely post-intervention, and this way you will avoid less uh, failures in limb loss, and surveillance is certainly a key in this paradigm. Thank you very much. So we will conclude this session with uh, a case presentation which will be given by Dr. Faisal Latif. Um, well, it's a kind of surprise case. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, it's maybe a simple case considering uh, how such complex techniques have been shown so far uh, so in this session. 
Uh, it was interesting to me because uh, I think I don't see this kind of uh, uh, disease uh, on a regular basis, so I decided to present this here in my disclosures. So a 62-year-old man, uh, more than 120 pack years history of smoking uh, bilateral lower extremity claudication at only 50 feet. He had non-obstructive CAD, uh, but had been experiencing uh, significant claudication. Uh, underwent an LEA that was pretty unremarkable. As you can see, ABIs were pretty normal. The continuous wave uh, Doppler uh, were also normal in the bilateral lower extremities. The PPGs were adequate bilaterally. However, the segmental pressures were abnormal uh, distally in both lower extremities, and the first digit pressure was below uh, normal bilaterally. So we did a CTA, and that shows a 60% isolated stenosis in the infrarenal aorta, normal iliac and femoral arteries, uh, and we used that CTA for sizing. So here is the invasive angiogram. We were actually, this was the angiogram done uh, 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 just as part of planning. And you can see this focal stenosis, and uh, uh, the rest of the aorta and the proximal iliacs look quite unremarkable. There was a 40 millimeter pressure gradient uh, across this stenosis. So uh, I uh, got into uh, a discussion with many of my uh, friends. Uh, what are the choices here? Uh, so I came across self-expanding stents from various vendors, uh, balloon expandable uh, options, uh, uh, like a Palma stent that used for coarctation because it, it's, uh, it grows with the, with the kids as they grow. Uh, so uh, I had to make a decision, and finally I settled with the uh, Medtronic endograft. Uh, this is uh, a planning uh, which, you know, uh, something that I do about twice a year. So I think it was interesting for, so, uh, for someone, uh, our operators like myself, who are not AAA operators. Uh, but I think th these cases are quite manageable by, uh, 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 by uh, 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 operators like myself. So uh, we uh, looked at the, based on the CTA size, the infrarenal aorta, both uh, uh, immediately before, uh, below the renal arteries as well as above the iliac bifurcation, measured the distances, and settled on a 20 by 20 by 82 millimeter stent graft, and uh, uh, obtained bilateral femoral axis, uh, a pigtail, uh, five French uh, marked pigtail from the left, uh, 14 French uh, access on the right, uh, which was pre-closed using two per-closes. Um, and then uh, this is, uh, uh, goes pretty fast. Uh, we deploy, deployed an uh, endurant uh, self-expanding um, <coughs> stent graft, uh, uh, which was well, well positioned uh, below the renal arteries and right above the iliac bifurcation, post-dilated using uh, a, a reliant balloon, um, and uh, uh, got, a, got a good result. So uh, in, in summary, uh, in such patients, uh, ABIs are not reliable uh, when they have isolated disease in the aorta and sometimes even in the iliacs. Um, use of CTA is critical in planning. I'm not someone who uses CTAs uh, regularly uh, for uh, these interventions, but I think for these cases, it's uh, critical for planning, for sizing. Uh, the choices of stent, uh, 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 many of my uh, friends have used uh, stents like uh, uh, ICAST and uh, Palma stents, uh, but self-expanding stents are probably uh, uh, used more frequently. I think exercise management uh, is, is more important in these patients, uh, so you have to pay uh, close attention to that. And possibly uh, yearly CTA surveillance uh, might be a good thing to consider. Uh, that's all that I have. Thank you. Thanks very much for the opportunity. So we have a few minutes left, uh, and, and the thank the faculty, everybody stayed on time, great. Any questions or comments from the audience before we uh, sort of address the, uh, the, the panel? I see a lot of experienced operators uh, out there. You guys, uh, I'm sure, have some comments. Good. Did, did yes, please, to ask yeah. them. <laughs> um, the evidence for that is really limited. I would guess that there is, and there's been a big move more in surgery for prehabilitation. Uh, and I would bet because of the improvement in the metabolic function of the vessels and the decrease in inflammation or oxidative stress, that there would be some improvement in patency, but it hasn't been established. 
So probably one, one question in addition to this. Um, it's, it's obvious that the combination of exercise therapy, lifestyle modification and revascularization makes the biggest benefit. Uh, how do you approach your patients in trying to convince them that not the simple short intervention procedure is the end of their responsibility for themselves in order to motivate them for an exercise uh, program? So this is in line with the, with the first question. Do you start uh, exercise training before indicating the intervention in general, or is this a case-based uh, case, um, based decision? For that, okay. So for that patient uh, who will have no access to rehab, I'll offer them an intervention because it's a one and done and we'll see how they do. Uh, for most patients, I'd much rather they start with exercise. Uh, the lifestyle changes that we all talk about, there's only two, in my opinion, that make any difference for the legs at all. Um, number one is cigarette cessation. I think that's really clear. Cigarette cessation reduces amputation by all of the terrible studies that we've seen before, going back 25 years, but uh, there will be no randomized study in this area. But for me, that's number one. So I, I usually tell the patients that no matter, I will do everything for you, and everything I do will be the equivalent of you stopping smoking. So you have one job, I have 12 jobs. Uh, this doesn't always convince people to stop smoking, but they get the point. The second one, uh, is actually putting them on statins. Whether you believe it or not, I think statins affect the metabolic function of muscles, and that's why in the three or four trials that were done, uh, two with Simva, one with Atorva, there was an increase in walking distance before pain, but not total claudication distance. So uh, I think those two things make a big difference. For me, though, you know, people don't get to be 120 pack year smoking patients without developing a certain set of habits. Uh, and so I find it's impossible to change every bad habit at once, and I, I try not to do that. So I want them, I want to make a couple of big breakthroughs, show them they can feel better, and then build on it. So I'll usually start with, how can we get you to stop smoking, and either exercise right up front or revascularization for the people that won't have good access to exercise. So the question was, uh, in patients with aortoiliac disease, when do you get a, uh, a, a cross-sectional imaging CTA MRA ahead of time? Um, uh, let me, let me uh, send that to Dr. Sukis. Well, I, I think it depends, uh, depends on a number of factors, of course. From a practical standpoint, uh, one, of, one of the most basic is what's their underlying renal function. And so if, if, a, if a patient has uh, significantly impaired renal function, then I'm going to think very carefully about, it, about getting a, um, uh, a CTA. Uh, you know, duplex ultrasound, if, if the patient's not significantly uh, obese, you can get some pretty uh, good looking, get a bit of good look at the, uh, at the aorta. Uh, and uh, again, if they're not obese, you can get, a, if you have an excellent ultrasound tech, you can usually get some good imaging of the, ili of the iliac vessels as well. Uh, and, and secondly, a lot of it depends on their clinical presentation. I mean, if someone has resting ABIs uh, that are very, very low, then you're going to, and they're incredibly symptomatic, then they're much more likely to have an underlying CTO. But as, as was illustrated by the case that I showed earlier, I mean, patient that I had actually didn't even have a, a drop in her ABI with exercise, yet she had a, a, a six centimeter occlusion of her, of her common iliac artery. So um, uh, if, if they're young and, not and if they're just presenting with claudication, 
Um, I don't think that by and large you need to get a CTA, but if you suspect that a patient has an underlying occlusion in those patients, I certainly think it can be very helpful in terms of planning your strategy. Are you going to go retrograde, anagrade, or are you going to have three access sites, both groins, and a brachial artery or radial artery? So uh, if they're very symptomatic and suspicion is high that they're going to have a CTO, then uh, I think getting an MRA or a CTA uh, as long as the renal function allows it is a very uh, nice way to plan your strategy. And then also, you know, of course, I was cringing. We've all been there when, when C. Hill showed his uh, case of the iliac perforation and having a CT ahead of time so that way you can sort of marshal uh, the troops. So make sure that you've got an OR in standby. Make sure you've got, a, you've got one of your surgical colleagues who's around and available. Uh, get that uh, uh, blood bank uh, 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 type and screen ready to go. So in, in those situations, I think if, if you have the luxury of being able to do a CTA, I think it'd be very helpful. I'll just um, add one quick thing to that. I think additionally, a CTA is very helpful for a patient who, who has an extensive history and it's not with you. Um, because it gives you, again, a kind of a roadmap so when you get to the operating room or you get to the cath lab, you go into it with a, a little bit more of a structured plan as to option A, B, and C. So for me, it's a little bit of, you know, in the operating room, we call it an archaeologic dig when we don't know someone and it's like the third or fourth time we've been in their groin. Well, a CTA gives you a three-dimensional view of a patient like that so that, you know, you don't need to have the left arm, you know, the, the left arm, the groin, everything kind of ready to go. You can just decide, okay, here's what my problem is, this is what I'm going to do, and you can be a little more focused. So with that, we close the session. It's 10 o'clock. The faculty are here if anybody has any, anything that you want to discuss. Thank you very much for attending.